warahmatullahi wabarakatuh kita pakai bahasa Jawa aja ya uh, saya berterima kasih kepada panitia terutama Pak Markus dan saya berterima kasih pada adik-adik semua yang sudah mau datang mudah-mudahan we can learn something together from the expert today and tomorrow Uh, today I'm going to present to you about a synchrotron based high energy optical conductivity on heterostructures and strongly correlated electron systems. There is a new phenomenon yeah, in the thin films. It's very fascinating at least in the past 15 years in which you can create a metallic sample from non-metal thin films. It's really, it's really impressive uh, the way how nature works, and it's very much some, it's something that we probably want to do in the future. I give you one example today about lanthanum aluminum O3 and strontium titanium O3. Yeah. Ada yang sudah pernah dengar bahan ini? Lanjut tangan. Belum pernah dengar? Pernah atau belum pernah? That's very good. Some of you know already. Many of you have never hear this one. So let me ask you these questions. Lanthanum alim O3. Yeah, look at the crystal structure. These are the crystal structure. Can you see it? These are the crystal structure. Which you have the lanthanum in the corner there. And you have the aluminum in the middle. And you have the oxygen center down. Okay? The interesting part, let me ask you this question, is the wrong direction. The electrical properties of the lanthanum molecule outside is that a metal or insulator? Who say insulator? Metal or insulator? No idea. It's actually these are insulator. Yeah, with very wide band gap, above five electron volt. Yeah. So the optical band gap. It's above 5 electron volt that we already answered it. Do you know is that a metal or is that non-magnetic or ferromagnetic material? Do you know that? It's non-magnetic. Yeah? So the LAO itself, because with LAO, lanthanum aluminum 3 is insulator and non-magnetic. One interesting phenomena about this lanthanum aluminum 3 we call it a polar system. Yeah, polar system means if you look at this as a layer by layer, lanthanum, there's one layer, and then there's aluminum, a lanthanum with the oxygen, there's another layer, and we have lanthanum aluminum outside another layer. So this consists of additional hole in it or missing electrons. So you have one plus layer. This side you have negative, you have excess electrons in the layer, and the other one you have positive charge. Right. So if you look at this, positive, negative, positive, what do you have in mind right now? It's a battery, right? It's a battery, you have positive charge, negative charge, positive charge, negative charge. So you can actually, if you can do that, you can actually uh, combine this positive, negative charge, positive, negative charge, really precise, you can have very strong, very um, uh, strong battery, and within a unit cell that is nanometer size yeah, but nature doesn't allow, allow you to do that easy easy <clears throat> so that's a, so there's a way to compensate what we call the polar system and this polar system might create a completely new physics phenomenon the way the nature works how to compensate the polarization divergence yeah it's Gauss law it's a Maxwell equation for the Maxwell equation so then you look at another material lanthanum aluminum 3 the crystal structure very much similar. Look at this. The only difference is that you have, in this case, you have strontium. In the other side, you have oxygen in the middle. On the other hand, you have titanium in the center. This part, you have aluminum in the center, right? But the crystal structure is very much similar. It's a cubic structure, okay? But now look at carefully what happened. This is material also in letter, I give you the answer right away. The optical band gap is still questionable. 
There's a lot of debate in the past, but I'm going to give you the answer. The, the optical band gap of strontium TiO3 is 3.7 electron volt. That's the first exotonic band, my exotonic state, by the way. And then you have, again, this is also non-magnetic in nature. And if you look at this, whether this polar or non-polar material, if you look at this, these are zero, there's no excess electron, there's no excess electron, there's no excess electron. This is what we call the non-polar system. Right? So you can have the same crystal structure and change the element. You can create polar versus non-polar. That's the physics we can learn today. How this polar system, if you integrate, yeah, if you place this polar system into non-polar material, the behavior might become a metal. And it's only a few layers, it's only at interfaces. So how does it work? So what happened the, in the group by our one that was discovered around 2004, and uh, Manhart from Germany, and um, a Villary group that's uh, 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 Triscon group from Switzerland. What they discover very fascinating, so they grow layer by layer. So they take strontium titanium or freeze what we call the substrate and they put an atom, put it on top on the STO, yeah, and then they grow in total what's called with lanthanum alum or three. And see what happened once you do that. Again, this is only atom by atom. Yeah, you don't pull it everything there, but put one atom and on top of another. <clears throat> And then they can count, they can measure the sheet reconductivity, which is, you can measure this resistivity or conductivity, inverse conductivity. Yeah. If the sheet conductivity is zero, that means insulator. There is no, there's no charge carrier over there. Right, think that one. If the sheet conductivity increases, that means towards a metal. Right? So take a look at this. This is the number of unit cell of lanthanum aluminum 3, the polar material, as a function of the sheet conductivity. Zero means there is no polar LAO, and then they increase to one unit cell, two unit cell, three unit cell, four unit cell, and they certainize it. Yeah? And one unit cell, again, is about four angstrom, four to five angstrom, and less, much less than nanometer. <clears throat> so if they do that, so this is a, this uh, at zero LA, for, at zero LAO they they, uh, they got this zero conductivity. They increase the number of into uh, LAO into two and three unit cell. They remain insulator, right? Because everything remains zero. But check what happened when you add another unit cell of LAO. The conductivity jump up tremendously. Yeah, from zero to something, and this is two times ten minus a uh, two times uh, uh, ten to the thirteen uh, electron per centimeter, right? The area. So when they increase the number of unit cell into sixteen, the conductivity remains there, but flat. It's almost the same. Right? So this fascinating phenomenon, there was this stuff around 2004, and this was a big hit in the oxide community, because probably we think of the new material for new energies, for instance, or even new devices, because things happen at interfaces. <clears throat> so the questions yeah, that we would like to understand, the field would like to understand, there's four important observations. First, there is so-called insulator metal transitions. Look at this, this insulator to metal. That's what we call with insulator metal transitions as a function of thickness. Yeah? And then a sharp transition, look at this. Only one unit cell, only adding up one unit cell. Yeah? You add another lanthanum, you add another aluminum, and then you add another three oxygen, it's become a metal. And it's not happened in nature. <clears throat> and the first and the next one, even though you add more layers, it remains constant. Yeah? <clears throat> and this number of electrons, the number of uh, sheet conductivity here, that proportional to about 0.05 electrons involved in transport measurements. That's what we want to understand. Can we understand such a phenomenon? Yeah. 
So to understand that, I have to use, I need to construct a new experimental technique because it's not easy to measure interface. It's not easy to measure surface, all right? So that's where we're gonna use so-called synchrotron. Have you heard about synchrotron before? Have you heard? Do you want to know? Okay, we do it next time, all right? Not today. So the Singapore, we have the Singapore Singapore light sword, and that's really ideal to look at phenomena with regard to, related to the surface interface because of the energy radius. <clears throat> so we construct a completely new beam line, what we call the beam line. So the distance from that corner to that point, for instance, is about 10 meters, so it's very long distance, with a pipes everywhere. So we construct from zero. So if you like design, you can do experiment uh, you can come being a physicist and become like art and design because you can do whatever you like over here too. <clears throat> but the key here is that you can have the photons tune the photon energy from electron volt, one or two electron volt, all the way to 1,500 electron volt. So you can scan almost of elements. Look at the elements of periodic table you have. You can really scan it and paint which element does something in the material. Okay. <clears throat> so this work, I've done it with my postdoc, Dr. Diao Chao Zheng and uh, Yu Zhejong. So it helps me and it took me seven years, five years to really develop and construct the beam light itself. It takes a lot of times when you do research. <clears throat> so this is the result. Yeah. So we grow the films. We do, we do uh, what we call with the pulse laser depositions. Yeah. So you really hit yeah, the target, what you have with the laser, and there's a pump coming out, and then you get one L atom and an atom on the substrate, and you measure that, you characterize that as a function of thickness extension. There's a fringes coming out from your read pattern. So the work done with my PhD student, this is Tegu, he's from Indonesia, and collaborate with another PhD student, I have uh, Anil, and the work done also together with uh, Ariando, this is my colleague, and uh, Fenki Fenkatesan, so we look at carefully the quality of the films. <clears throat> yeah, look at this material, look at this data. Now we need to learn how to look at the data carefully. So if you look at this, reflectivity, what you want to measure is electron. Yeah? One way to measure electron is to measure reflectance as a function of energy. So the y-axis here is reflectivity versus photon energy, right? <clears throat> so then you make comparison, this is bulk STO, bulk LAO. Remember, bulk means without adding up both materials, so it's independent material. And then you have two unit cell, three unit cell, four unit cell, six unit cell of lanthanum molybdenum or three on strontium titanium of Right, so you really control that number of units. And remember once again, if you look at this, if you do not do experiment without the silicon, if you do a, a, a regular experiment, it's very hard to distinguish between two and three unit cell and four and six unit cell. Remember what you want to understand is that three and four unit cell, two and three are insulator, yeah, insulating material, and four and six are a metal. So we want to understand how to explain these are insulator and these are the metals, right? But then you scan the energy, yeah? You do the experiment, you do reflectance measurement all the way, and you scan up to 35 electron volt. It's a huge number there, yeah? Then you can see surprising huge difference in reflectance measurement between around 15 to 20 electron volt. Yeah, look at the spectral weight here, what we call the intensity. So if you look at the intensity here, two and three unit cells are down there. Right? Look at this, yeah, two and three green color and blue color are down there. And four and six unit cells is up there. So as soon as there's a metal in the material itself, there's a jump of reflectivity, but the jump of the reflectivity is not down here, but rather up there. That was missing. So for about 10 years, people doing research in LAO-STO in this field, they missed this structure, this metal transitions. 
Yeah? So we have a problem in the past to explain it. Now you can explain it the phenomena where this electron coming from in the interfaces. Right? Because to begin with, they are both insulator material. Yeah? To begin with. <coughs> then you can extract physics to them. You should be able to extract the optical conductivity. Yeah? Take a look at the actual equation that you're going to learn. There's an optical conductivity you can extract. And if you integrate the optical conductivity underneath the spectrum, then you are getting the number of electrons in the system. Right? So you can precisely tell you, oh, there's a 10 electron there. There's a 5 electron per unit cell, or there's a 20 electron per unit cell. You can tell that so precise if you identify the spectra with proper. Right? <clears throat> now we do that. We integrate the spectra with. Yeah, we integrate the spectral weight of reflectivity and then we can find out the origin of the metal for 4 and 6 unit cell of LAOST. Okay, so take a look what happened. It turns out that, again, this is the number of LAO per unit cell and this is the number of electrons per unit cell for individual this on the top part is the number of electron of lao with respect to bulk lso yeah and the bottom part is the number of electron in the interface of lao sto with respect to sto itself yeah? so if you look at zero that means there is no change in number of electrons if you get positive value there that means there is additional electrons which is coming from somewhere it has to come from somewhere yeah? and you cannot just steal electron if you steal the electron then you go to jail and yeah? you cannot steal the electron you have to go to somewhere or come from somewhere <clears throat> and then the same thing with sto if you look at zero almost zero means there's nothing changes in terms of number of electron in sto in interfaces right so what really surprising result is that look at the green color here. The green color is the number of electrons in SDO, but only at interfaces. In which for four unit cell and five unit cell and six unit cell, there is additional electron, about half electrons. That gives you the metallism, the metals. And there's additional electron at SDO interfaces. Where is, that where is that electron coming from? It turns out those half electrons are coming from LAO layers on top of it. Remember, you have lanthanum aluminum O3, which is defined by separate layers, lanthanum O, LAO, or ALO layers, and each of them contribute almost about half a uh, quarter electrons per unit cell, and each of them provide electron into or transfer electron into the LAO SEO interfaces. Right? Now we know the phenomenon. We can create any material becomes metal to insulator based on the charge transfer. We can force the electron to move from one side to another side. Yeah? The question is that how to force it? Why this electron move from LAO to the STO? <coughs> this tending the same time. We also able to explain what so-called the we can also detect what so-called vacancies, yeah? like stoichiometry of your material. In this case, as it turns out, for three or for five, six unit cell and above, where the sample are uh, metal, it turns out there is so-called oxygen vacancies. At the surface of LAO, the oxygen tends to remove out from the samples, and that release an electron back. And the electron from that surface going toward to the interface to compensate the polarization divergences. Yeah? So it's very interesting phenomena in physics and yet very simple to explain if you are able to calculate to measure the total number of electrons. Right? And the same thing with other semiconductor, you can use the same technique too. Then we also find out more than that that for insulating samples, there is still electron moving from one side to another side, but the electron is moving within the layers, yeah, within the LAO itself. If you look at this, 
the electron is moving from the red color to the blue color, and the electron from the red color moves to down there, and etc. etc. Yeah. So in nature, this doesn't happen, it goes different ways. Right? So what does it mean? Now I can make, for instance, a device, yeah, completely different device now, based on only simple number of layers. I can create metal in this side and so on the other side by adding one layer and create oxygen vacancies. And I can put it back and become an uh, insulator if I put the oxygen vacancies back. Yeah, put the electron back or put the oxygen back, then you can create some more insulator metal transitions. And this world was then, uh, it, it's a very interesting story that in the beginning, we, as, when you do the experiment, when you analyze the data, you need to make assumptions. Right? So if your assumption is not correct, the whole analysis becomes also not correct, right? So our work being uh, uh, reviewed and being uh, quite at the beginning was challenged by a group in the uh, United States and Germany, and it was very lucky that what they mentioned here that in our in uh, in our uh, what is this? I cannot see this. Huh? In our prison work, yeah, uh, they using in situ ellipsometry measurements. They actually confirm all the assumptions by, made by our group, yeah? and that's they agree with the analysis that there is so-called spectral weight transfer from the LEO into the STO and the change of the electric constant. So it's very important. That, it's also very important that once you have this result, something, yeah, other people will try to find out whether that's correct or not because they're interested in science. Yeah? that's what uh, 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 Graham mentioned this morning. They want to find out what happened with the polycrystal sample, right? It turns out it's not that high at the moment. And that's become questionable with the thin sample, right? So there's something that if you want to do research, do it properly because other group might come and uh, chasing your result too. So anyway, <clears throat> so we look at that phenomenon because once you do experiment, you also want to build up a model, a theory. Yeah. So this one, uh, uh, in my group, we also bring uh, theoretical calculations. So June is my PhD student, Yang Ming is my postdoc, and we collaborate with uh, George Watsky and Yuan Ping Feng to calculate whether the phenomena that we explain we can, is consistent with the band structure, for instance. Yeah, band structure calculation. So we look at that carefully. We, in, we extract the whole experimental, what has been done in the past. Look at this, all these experimental things, yeah? from transport, XRD, high energy optics, and etc. etc. when we categorize them and then we put them into a picture, a model. <clears throat> and your model, the model has to be able to has to be able to explain the experimental data. So what we found that for two, if we only have two and three unit cell where everything remains in sweater, <clears throat> there is so-called buckling so-called lattice distortion, right in interface. Okay. The lattice distortions compensate the polarization divergence in the LAO. That's the way the nature or the thin films try to compensate the polarization divergence. <coughs> but as soon as you put four unit cell, buckling is not sufficient to compensate the polarization divergence in it. Yeah, the buckling, the lattice distortion is not good enough. It's not, it's not strong enough to compensate the, polar, the polarization divergence. So what happened is that, <coughs> then we calculate the total number of energies. What happened when we increase the number of layers? As it turns out, when you increase the number of layers, the oxygen in the surface tend to release from the sample. And that's way, when the surface of the oxygen comes out from the surface, yeah, <coughs> the buckling reduces. Yeah, no buckling anymore, and the insulator metal transition is due to the oxygen vacancies at the surface. So you look at, now you can really see that when you do physics, you really need to have a good chemistry. Yeah, because everything related to the uh, stoichiometry, you really need to understand that properly, and that's Whatever you do, for instance, if you make thin films, you really have to consider surface before you think deeper what happened in the interface. Yeah, because even though they are very thick samples, 
surface still connected very nicely with the interface through this phenomena, so-called charge transfer phenomena. So we are able to explain the whole experimental data, yeah, the whole experimental data available at the time from a uh, uh, different type experiment, and then we are able to construct a model to explain it based on the band structure point of view. Yeah. Now you are ready to go for the next step. Can you really control oxygen vacancy stuff? How to control release? If you can do that, you can create the same layer, three unit cell, four unit cell, and some part you pull oxygen out, some part you put the oxygen back. You have metal in sort of metal transition. Yeah, you can make very nice PN junction, PNP junction at the end of the day too. So in the end, what we want to have is to replace the current semiconductor. Right? That's our what our goal generally. So to summarize what happened, yeah, so the interplay of electronic reconstruction, lattice distortions, surface oxygen vacancies is responsible for insulator meta transition in the LAO STO. <coughs> the second part is that we show the potency of high energy optical conductivity. So this is new technique that we develop to construct yet yeah, that we construct. So we are able to really measure what's so called the spectral weight transfer and various type of vacancies in the correct electron system, but also various type in the thin films or 2D materials as well. So you can actually apply this technique, but it's a very simple, it's very simple technique and it's very interesting for physics point of view. Because what you need to understand is a Maxwell equation to begin with. And, but that's not the end of it. Five more minutes. All right. Five. Five. All right. Okay, I have ten more minutes. <laughs> so, but, <clears throat> but you always need to criticize your result. Yeah, it's very important that you criticize the result. So, what we found that our the high energy optical conductivity measure 0.5 electrons. Okay, that's the technique, the optical conductivity, the reflected technique that we show you. Transport, on the other hand, measure only 0.05 electron. So there's a missing of 0.45 electrons, right? In science, you have to find out where this electron goes at the end. Yeah, it cannot just disappear. Otherwise, you cannot explain the phenomena problem, right? <clears throat> so we look at carefully. So then the next question, how to explain such a discrepancies? Look at this STO. What happened with STO? That is, that is the question itself. Yeah? In the past, if you read literature, STO, or what we call it STO, strontium titanium 3 they call with a passive material. Passive material means that it will just stay there, it, it won't disturb anything on top of it. Yeah, that was a passive material. We want to find out whether that really is a passive material as what uh, uh, believe for 100 years, for example, 50 years, whatever, many years in the past. So what's going on with STO? And then the first thing you need to do is read the literature. Yeah, you read everything down there. Go back to 1965 papers. Where were you in 1965? Student. Where were you? Ada di mana, Mbak? Tahun 1965. You don't know? All right, I don't know either because I wasn't here. Yeah, so you go back to 1965 papers and read all the way to 2008 papers. So what we found, yeah, you read all the literatures, 50 papers and everything. What we found that there's a discrepancies in previous optical spectroscopy studies, particularly near its uh, characteristic in the STO, strontium titanium O3. So there's a different result from one experiment to another experiment, right? So not, you get really confused, right? So what happened yesterday with her? When you're confused, you must be happy. You should be happy now because you have a job to do now, right? So something that something new should happen. But all this paper yeah, agree, or at least one of the papers state that existence of excitonic effect had been explicitly mentioned to be absence. That was physical review letter in 1970. And this was referred to many, many papers until before our publication comes. 
Yeah, it was absent. Exciton was absent, and exciton itself having electron bow interactions, and some of the exciton what we call the resonant exciton even having electron electron and electron bow interaction. That is the consistent. And if that happens, you cannot call the STO as a passive material anymore. We want to find out if there is electron bow interactions strong enough or to create the exciton in STO. Yeah? So the conclusion was that from the literature studies, very confusing and no one has done or published temperature dependent spectroscopic ellipsometry in the broad energy means. So it's a good thing to do to do something. Yeah. <clears throat> so then uh, with uh, Pranjal is my PhD student, Paolo Trevisanato is my postdoc, Daniel Schmidt is my postdoc, and uh, Lorenzo is my postdoc. We collaborate with um, Valerio uh, uh, and also with uh, 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 Sidichi. So we perform some experiment to test our result with uh, with facility in Japan. And we want to make sure that everything reproducible. And then we look at carefully just strontium titanium body, something that has been studied for more than six years. But this time we want to find out what we call with exit. Yeah, see whether the exciton is really absent. Then we look at carefully again the optical conductivity. This is the epsilon one, epsilon two. Yeah, this epsilon two, the real part of optical conductivity, and this is the imaginary part of the optical conductivity. And then this is the differences between the real part and that is the imaginary part as a function of temperature. Yeah? And then we perform the theoretical calculation. So experiment one, two, three are experimental data and then compare with theoretical calculations. What is really interesting is that if you look at this structure, there's a very sharp structure. There's a very sharp structure in the absorption part of the difference in the optical conductivity and they change dramatically as a function of temperature. Okay? And this structure was missing for all the experiments in the past. They never measured. All the experiment was done below what so called three electron volt. Yeah. And then we look at, then we calculate. You can calculate the optical conductivity. You can calculate the dielectric functions, real part, marginal part, but this time you explicitly include electron, electron, and electron co interactions through, for instance, GW beta sulfator equations. You can do it. Yeah. So now you can see between the red and this black color, red and black, the black color, it was assumed to be no exciton at all, or this assumed that there is no electron, 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 whole interaction in STO. Yeah? That was our knowledge in the past for many, many years. And now we can we include the electron interaction. If you do that properly, you have the spectral weight shift dramatically to low energy part. And that spectral weight, if you look at the sharp structure there, is very much close or even on top of the temperature dependent of the sharp structure in the difference of optical conductivity epsilon 2. Right? So now we understand something that when we look at SPO, it turns out we really have to consider what we call with the correlation in STO, electron electron co interactions. What does it mean then? What it means that if you place something yeah, on STO, you place whatever thin films, you place graphene, for instance, or you place to other 2D material, it might change dramatically the optical conductivity because of the correlation. Right? So we test our knowledge. Yeah, we challenge if our knowledge is correct that STO have the electron electron bow interaction, place graphene on it, the optical conductivity of graphene should change dramatically as well. So we did that. Yeah? So we did that experiment now again with my postdoc Iman and uh, uh, sorry uh, Pranjal and this is uh, Iman was my postdoc now he is the Gajah Mada University yeah, Iman Santoso and Paulo Trevi Sanoto and Yang Ming was my postdoc and Long Kian Ping uh, 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 my colleague uh, from chemistry and this is Antonio Castro Neto one of the pioneer in the graphene uh, uh, research theoretical calculation so we look at graphene. We place graphene on strontium titanium both. The idea is that how big the change is, or how big the change of the optical conductivity of graphene because of the correlation effect. 
Now look at the result directly. So if you place graphene, yeah, look at this result. This is graphene on silicon dioxide. Right? This is very important. If you want to tell your graphene, a really freestanding graphene, it should look like this. This is what we call with the resonant exciton. You must have this. Yeah. So if you don't measure this resonant exciton or change in graphene, also change dramatically what happened in resonant exciton. Now if you place graphene on strontium titanium O3, look at the structure of the blue color here. There's this thing missing now, it disappeared, completely disappeared, yeah? and the four spectra weight toward low energy. Yeah? This enhancement tiny little bit there, but this interesting part is that you can really make the graphene become transparent yeah, in the UV because of the interactions with strontium titanium. So it's really amazing phenomena that correlations, electron, electron, electron hole correlation in, in SDO change dramatically what happens with the material on top. Okay? So to summarize the talk that we have, what we learned today is that hopefully we learned today is that electron, electron, electron hole interactions yield to what so called anemulous exiton, what resonant exiton. And it turns out they are very important for the electronic structure, electronic band structure of the strontium titanium 3. So I would like to warn everyone that if be careful with any statement by saying STO is a passive material, it's not a passive material. And then you can also study with the same technique, now we can also study other type of substrate, but you think yeah, it's only doing nothing on the, on the uh, whatever material on top of it. No, the reason is that because the future technologies that we would like to have is that very thin layer, 2D material and everything, and that has to be placed on something, right? So you cannot just hang or lay hanging around. <coughs> so to summarize also that we present you the potency and new technique, so-called the high energy optical conductivity, to reveal exotic phenomena, new phenomena, yeah? In oxide, for instance, heterostructures, and corrected electron system in general and the methodology present here is applicable to many type of samples including the nano material as well thank you very much thank you please give applause for bang Rusdi. okay thank you bang Rusdi, for uh, interesting presentation about leo